Louisiana Legends is made possible by Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Louisiana. This important program series enables us to discover, through the accomplishments of our fellow Louisianians, the unique character of a state so proudly served by Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Louisiana for 60 years. My guest is the great Cajun, Louisiana, American chef, John Foltz. I don't normally begin these programs with a story. We go right to the guest, but this time I want to begin with a short story because I think it tells everything about John Foltz and everything about Louisiana and what makes it different than any other state. Two or three years ago, my son, who lives in New York, was visiting us in Baton Rouge. And Leanne and I and my son went to John's restaurant at the foot of the Sunshine Bridge, Lafitte's Landing, for Thanksgiving buffet. I introduced John to my son, told him he was from New York. We ate the marvelous food. When we were through dining, John motioned to my son to come in the kitchen. He did. John fixed him a box, a take-home package, a care package to take back to New York. No charge, just John Fultz, just a little Louisiana lanyap. And that's what makes us different. I asked my son, I said, what would be the possibility of something like this happening in New York? He burst out laughing. John, good to be with you. <laughs> Thank you And so merci much. for that day. <laughs> John, how does a man begin this, this journey as a, as, as, a, as a great chef? Where does it start? Well, well, first, I, I think uh, if you're lucky enough to be born in one of the greatest states in the Union, if you're lucky enough to be born of a culture that is uh, 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 just so full of enthusiasm and excitement when it comes to living, when it comes to cooking, when it comes to family, uh, then you're a lucky guy. And I think that's probably where I started. I was born into a Cajun family in South Louisiana, 40 miles west of New Orleans, right in the heart of Cajun country. I was born of a big Cajun family, uh, eight children. My mother died at a very early age, so we came together as a group to kind of help each other out. Uh, what, what, what else can, can I say? I mean, that's where it all began. That's where it with started. With your mom. Yeah, with my mom. And, uh, and because of the life that I lived as a young child, a good appreciation for work and certainly a good appreciation for, for people, uh, I think that's what uh, gave me the ability to become a, a, a chef and a restaurateur and to love what I do today. John, it's so interesting. Uh, uh, the three great uh, uh, chefs whom I've had the pleasure of, of knowing and working with to an extent are Paul Prudhomme, my beloved friend Justin Wilson, and yourself. And all three of you have one thing in common. Your mother started this journey of becoming a chef. Uh, I might add one more name to that list, Dr. Michael DeBakey whose mother taught him to sew, which <laughs> came in very handy. John, so uh, your mother, uh, uh, right there working with her in the kitchen, is where it started. I want to ask you a question that I've heard discussed a thousand times. I grew up in Lafayette. What is the difference between Cajun and Creole cooking cuisine? Uh, well, just very simply, when, when I think of Cajun, I think of the French Catholics who left the coastal areas of France around 1620 to settle a new land that they referred to or called uh, Acadia or Acacia. And uh, uh, the slang of the people who lived in Acacia, the Acadians, of course, is the word Cajun. They were exiled from Canada or Nova Scotia, as we know the place today, uh, to Louisiana in 1785 and came to settle the swamp lands and bayous of this state after being exiled by the English from uh, Canada. They lived a simple existence in the swamplands. They depended on the swamp floor as their pantry. They cultivated all of these wonderful wild fruits, vegetables, wild game, crawfish, crabs. I mean, what else could a, a people want? Uh, the greatest 
uh, uh, pantry in the world. So this one-pot cuisine that we know of today as Cajun cooking developed in the swamp lands from a people who were exiled in searching for a new homeland and found a very friendly Louisiana to take them in. And we have lived and prospered here for the last 200 years. Uh, the Creoles, on the other hand, uh, are normally referred to as the second generation, the children of the Europeans who came to settle New Orleans in the late 1600s. They lived in their own areas uh, in and around the city. However, after one generation, they started to intermarry. And the word Creole actually comes from this old Spanish word, Creola, meaning a mixture of cultures. Uh, naturally, since they came from the different uh, uh, countries of Europe, their cuisine and their lifestyle depict a European tradition. So a lot of flair and flambe in the city of New Orleans with Creole people and cuisine, and in the country, uh, the rural areas, the bayous, the French Acadian settled. So very different cultures, very different cuisines, but truly the origin of Louisiana cooking. Now, John, I'm going to ask a question that people are going to think, I'm, our audience is going to think that I'm going quite crazy. <laughs> Let's say that I'm walking in Beijing, China tonight. That's a far piece. So what's that, about 10,000 miles? Yeah, pretty far. I'm walking in Beijing, China tonight, and I miss home, and I say, oh, I wish I could get either some gumbo or a good crawfish etouffee. Am I crazy, or is it possible? <laughs> well, you're lucky, because today it's possible, thanks to uh, uh, the Hilton International chain, which uh, I've been working with for a long time to bring Louisiana and American regional cooking around the world. To date, I've opened my Louisiana restaurant in 14 different countries to showcase, first of all, Louisiana's culture, music, its food, uh, but then at the same time to give people from other lands the ability to sample this wonderful uh, joie de vivre, this wonderful joy of living that we call Louisiana. In Beijing today, in fact, at the Hilton Hotel, is the restaurant Louisiana. The menu was developed here in Cajun country by myself and my staff. The uh, chefs trained here in Louisiana. Crawfish and gumbo and etouffee is on the table in Beijing tonight, and you and I could both get a nice steaming bowl of it. But no music, <laughs> no, no Cajun music. Oh, absolutely. absolutely. Yeah? Uh, in fact, every hour or so, the music changes from Zydeco to jazz to Cajun, because I think it's very important when we assist with these uh, restaurants around the world that it really depicts the true culture of Louisiana and we are uh, a state of seven or eight different cultures and a marrying many years ago so this all of this melange we are the gumbo right we're the we gumbo really are. and uh, to be able to depict the music the art we have Cajun art on the wall the art of uh, George Roderick and the art of Marion Goodwin and all of these wonderful people uh, on the wall the music and of course the food so when you walk into that restaurant you feel that you're in Louisiana, including the big mural of the Delta Queen steaming down the river. Wow. <laughs> Is the restaurant popular there? Yeah, and I understand that they're serving about 500 uh, covers per day, which is pretty, pretty uh, usual, in fact, in the restaurants that we open around the, uh, the, the country. Normally, I open them myself. I go in for two weeks. I bring my staff. I bring all of the ingredients so people can really get a good feeling for what the Louisiana products are. And then I'll leave that restaurant, and it either remains open in its entirety or a portion of the menu remains open. Um, so it's very, very popular. You're from kind of a Johnny country. Appleseed, aren't you? Planting this <laughs> Cajun food all over the world. That, that's, uh, that's probably a good analogy. Uh, uh, and, and what fun it is, because it gives us at the same time not only an opportunity to showcase Louisiana and showcase what it is that makes us so different, as you say, but at the same time, look at what it gives us, the ability to walk these strange lands and look at the strange ingredients, rub shoulders with some of the greatest cooks of the world, and bring that back to Louisiana. And after all, that's how we were created here. Uh, it's not Louisianians who were cooking Louisiana food in the 1600s. It was people from all other lands. And to go and find the origin of our food and bring it back here gives us a much better understanding of what we should be doing to make it right. This state is truly the melting pot, isn't it? You hear about the melting yeah. pot. <clears throat> we are. Uh -huh. I think uh, by definition, if America is the melting pot, then how can Louisiana not be the origin of it? As I mentioned just a minute ago, seven nations coming here at the same time, intermarrying after one generation, using all the true Louisiana or American products to create 
food, but at the same time create a new nation that took place over 150 years. It happened in New Orleans. It really did. What uh, about a third of us in Louisiana are black, Ryan? African American. Sure. What has been that influence? Tremendous influence when you assume that the blacks are when you know that the, that the uh, uh, the African Americans today. Uh, uh, were one seventh of the of the nations who came to settle this state at some point in our history, <clears throat> the black hand in the pot as we call it. The lady who taught me to cook after my mother died at seven was a wonderful, wonderful black lady by the name of Mary Fairshow. She raised us at the stove. She taught us to cook. The black hand in the pot from plantation cooking to obviously the great restaurants of New Orleans, the origin of Creole cuisine, the understanding of the use of these wild ingredients, because after all, they came from Africa and understood all of these blending of spices and ingredients. Had it not been for the black hand in the pot, as I say uh, in my own writings, that uh, this influence just so dramatic in our cooking, Louisiana cooking would not be what it is today and certainly not be as popular as it is today. What's the difference in a chef and a cook? Oh, about 50000 a year. <laughs> uh, I, actually, actually, the difference between a, a chef and a cook, very, very simple. The chef is the manager. The chef is the teacher. The chef is the one of responsibility in the kitchen. The cooks are aspiring chefs. They're the ones who's coming up the ladder to one day be the leader in the kitchen. So the chef is the guy who's... Uh, the buck stops right there. You opened uh, one of these international restaurants in Russia, right. on Russian soil. What kind of experience was that? Well, it was 1988, and uh, uh, my quest to open one restaurant on all continents and one restaurant in areas where no American restaurant had ever stood was the goal. That was the mission. And in 1988, after petitioning the Soviet government for about three years to allow me to come into Moscow to open my Louisiana promotional restaurant, with no response, one day I was lucky enough to get a, a, a communique from the Soviets asking that I come to Moscow and, and meet with them on this venture. Uh, I did. Uh, jumped on an air flight plane out of New York, uh, Cajun bar from the bayous, not knowing who I was even going to see because they gave me no direction, only where to go. <laughs> Uh, I arrived there, negotiated the restaurant through six or seven interpreters. It was a real experience, only to come back home and find out that not only had they given me the right to open this restaurant, but they had failed to tell me that that was at the same time of the Reagan-Gorbachev summit of 88, and that they were using this opportunity to bring a, an American restaurant into the city to, first of all, I think, have good quality cuisine, because the cuisine was very inept at that time, uh, lacking certainly in the city of Moscow. So I was able to open my restaurant uh, at the time that Reagan and Gorbachev met and shook hands in Moscow. We fed an average, I'll never forget this as long as I live, uh, we fed somewhere around 5,000 people in the, wow. 10 days that, the 10 days that we were open. I brought 17 tons of food to Moscow because my travels there told me that I'd have to bring everything, including some of the equipment and 20 members of the team to make that happen. Of course, the, the night the restaurant opened, uh, all of the media and everybody else was there to see that ribbon cutting because it was the first time a foreign venture had opened on Soviet soil since the Bolshevik Revolution. So it was a very historic event and I just happened to be the lucky guy to do it, and it was an experience of a lifetime. If you'd have gone there a few years before, you'd ended up cooking in one of those gulags, you know, <laughs> up around Siberia. Try, try some of those ice carvings. John, now it had to be a great thrill, and it had to be a little awesome for you to be able, uh, for you to be asked to prepare a dinner, a Vatican State dinner, and then you had a private audience with Pope John II. Yeah, well, you know, coming, coming from a Catholic, French Catholic Cajun background, Naturally, the, the, the greatest honor in the world is to be able to meet the Holy Father, and nobody, no one would ever expect that that would happen, especially not from a cook. Uh, uh, and to be invited to, to the Vatican to do a state dinner back in 1990, and to, to go, to, go to, to the Vatican knowing that I would prepare a meal for all of the cardinals and may get a glimpse of the Holy Father, uh, was going through my mind, but after the dinner was over 
and understanding that the Holy Father cannot attend social functions and it's not a part of... I did what, not know that. Yeah, yeah, they do not allow... You will never see the Holy Father sitting at a big bank Almost like in, a prisoner the Bible. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, I, was, um, I was instructed that I would be picked up the next morning and driven to uh, Castel Gandolfo, an hour out of Rome, to attend Mass at the home of the Holy Father, the summer a home of the Holy Father, and be able to talk with him about food. Uh, it, it was it was just unbelievable, and and we did, and uh, uh, ended up spending about an hour with him in in, in his home at Gandolfo. What, 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 this is probably an unfair question. What was your impression of him as a man? Well, I think for the first time in my life, I experienced in reality what holiness is all about. You know, we talk about holiness. We talk about uh, this feeling of the Holy Spirit, and that's 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 words to a lot of people. But as I was sitting in that chapel, very small, with about three or four pews, and realized that I could reach right over and touch the Holy Father, the presence in that room, looking out over the hills of Rome, looking out to the dome of St. Peter about 40, 50 miles ahead, I realized that that was as close to heaven as I'm probably going to ever get. <laughs> Quite an what, what a feeling of holiness. It's so it was almost a mystical experience for you. Well, it was a mystical experience. First of all, it was an opportunity that until the minute it happened didn't exist and would never exist. Then once it happened, it was over so quickly, I realized that that was a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity that had just happened to me. I had just experienced something that very few people in the world experience, and I would have to treasure in my heart forever. No one would ever know unless they experience it what that was all about. John, uh, where's your next international restaurant going to be? Well, uh, I'm constantly looking for places that may be just a little different. I mean, you know, I've opened in Paris and I've opened my restaurant in London, but let's face it, that's not exotic. I mean, that's not anything that's going to capture the imagination. Everybody does things there. I'm always looking for things that's a little bit different. You know, I know that I want to open on the African continent. I know I want to do something there where I can uh, go out into the, into the wilderness area and experience some of the origins of this black hand in the pot that I mentioned a minute ago. It's so important in our cooking. Uh, I know I want to do something uh, in and around uh, Greenland and Iceland in that area, Norway. I hadn't done anything there because of the great seafood industry and all of the wonderful... But where do you go next? Uh, the, next uh, the next trip, Seoul, Korea. In the fall, I'll open my restaurant in Seoul. And then Taipei, Taiwan will follow immediately after that. And that will represent the 16th foreign restaurant that I open uh, representing Louisiana's cuisine and culture. So Seoul and Taipei. Now... You're a dynamo. I mean, I, you, you, I find your energy exhausting. Uh, <laughs> I, I envy you for possessing it. You, you, you're in, in, in a multi-business uh, uh, sphere, aren't you? Uh, you, d you do several things. For example, we're taping this program at a plantation, White Oak Plantation that you own. And this magnificent setting is prepared by John's staff back of us. It's the only time I've ever seen a TV set that I could eat. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 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 and then you have your, oh, I know what I wanted to ask you. If you asked me to pick a place in the United States of America where a restaurant would not work, I would say at the foot of the Sunshine <laughs> Bridge surrounded by industry. But you've got this fabulously successful restaurant. How did you pick that location? <laughs> Uh, well, I was too naive to know that location matters. <laughs> uh, th there's an old saying in the restaurant business or, or in industry, in a business in industry, that there's no distance too far to travel or location too difficult to find when there's rumor of perfection. I heard that and I said, well, if that's true, then all we have to do is put great food on the table, serve it with a lot of pomp and circumstance, but yet be very casual about it where people could have a lot of fun and they would come. That was uh, many years ago. I opened, in 19, I opened on Bastille Day, 1978, because the place is called Lafitte's Landing. I wanted to honor Jean Lafitte on Bastille Day. Uh, we opened there in... Uh, it, uh, Gus, it, it was tough. It took five years. I mean, had it not been for great bankers, had it not been for people who trusted... Uh, uh, Were that, you tempted uh, to give up? Never. Never, never, I know never. you had a difficult time. Yeah. I, I, I never did 
ever think that I was going to give up. In fact, I used to tell people all the time when they would say, do you think you're going to make it? I said, look, I'll put golden arches over this building before I shut it down. <laughs> but did, I did know, some, never. Did some dear friends and well-meaning people think you were crazy to open a restaurant Oh, there? no, ab absolutely. I mean, first of all, six or seven restaurants had failed at that location I before. See. It was in the middle of nowhere. People had to drive an hour to get there. Uh, I opened up there because it was eight miles from where I was born and reared. It was the heart of Cajun country, the most wonderful area, romantic area of Louisiana with the plantation homes. It was unnatural for people to want to visit, and why not eat while you're there? Well, it took the world about six years to find out, but that was true. <laughs> but it, it did work, yeah. John, when uh, when you want to go out and eat, what kind of food do you enjoy when you don't want to, when you don't want it to be John Fulls food? What kind of food do you enjoy? Uh, you, you know, people ask all the time, or people say all the time, the worst thing that could ever happen to me would be if I had to feed a chef. Exactly. It'd be the worst thing. But what people don't realize is that we have the ability to cook the greatest food in the world. We're always sharing that food with the public. All we want is a great slice of meatloaf, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Give us a good round steak and gravy with Simplicity. a little magic. Yeah. Simplicity is what we strive for when we're not in the kitchen, you know? Is Cajun cuisine food uh, a finish now, I mean, it, as a developing art form or can we look for new things in, in the years ahead? Is the food in, in fluctuation and flux? Cajun cuisine since its inception in 1785 here in Louisiana, as Creole uh, since 1690, is a cuisine in evolution. Uh, we're an ever-changing culture. We're, uh, the highways and interstates are going through the bayous and swamplands of Louisiana. Uh, new people are coming in, uh, new chefs are coming in from Louisiana who's trained at the Culinary Institute of America in Johnson and Wales. Now we have the greatest ingredients and an appreciation for cooking. Now we know how to cook and why to cook the way we do. So now we're able to come back into the kitchens and realize that with these great ingredients, there's new things we can do. So we will constantly see this cuisine grow. We will constantly see it evolve. People ask all the time, is Cajun cooking dead now that the fad is over? Yes. Of course not. I mean, how can one of the greatest regional cuisines in the world ever die? This is the origin of American cooking. This cuisine can't die. This cuisine will only grow and get better. I meet people who tell me, I was in New Orleans 30 years ago. The food was fabulous. They don't remember where they went but they always remember the food. Right. That was 30 years ago. You're going to hear the same thing in 300 years if I have anything to say about it. John, you have an apprentice program uh, where uh, young men and women come to you to become chefs, right. don't you? How does that work? Uh, well, un unfortunately, I wish I had the Superdome to, to work out of because we have so many young people dying to get to Louisiana to learn about this wonderful regional cooking. Uh, we work with a couple of the culinary universities around the country. We take in apprentices who are in school, serious cooks, wanting to get into the uh, uh, an apprenticeship program to How learn this cooking. How long does this course of learning last with you? Normally all? we ask that they spend about two years two with years. us, even though a lot of these programs only last 90 days. The university will send students here for 90 days. If someone walks in off of the street with a good background and a, a, a desire to cook, we say, give us two years and we'll teach you how to cook this cuisine and then go out and teach somebody else. So Is it still years. a joy for you when you spot a student and you know they've got that something? Uh, Gus, it's easy to spot. You know, I guess it's like, like anything else. Once you cook and once you understand what cooking is all about, someone walks into the door and I can just see, I, and I mean this, and I don't mean this arrogantly, I mean it very sincerely, I can tell if there's a cook in that person. Uh, there's a, if there's a cook buried down in that body somewhere, you can tell right away, just through the mannerisms, the kitchen vision, I call it, the ability to see what's going on around you. Because that's what's cook cooking is, is an art form. Uh, we use a plate as our canvas. That's the only difference. Uh, but you can tell if a person's going to be a cook. There's a burning desire to learn and learn and learn. And you can spot that right away. And that person will become a great, great chef. And I've, thank God, I've had... 10, 15, 20 chefs who today are some of the greatest chefs in this country who came through those kitchens down in Bayou Country down there. And uh, it's a great thing to open the newspaper and see their picture and realize and that, that they got their And that influence will always be with them. Oh, absolutely. Sure, of course it will. John, it's been a joy being with you. And what I really love about John Foles is his love of Louisiana. 
her people, her culture, her history, her past. Uh, uh, you're a marvelous ambassador uh, uh, of, of all that we love as well as, of course, a great chef. And merci beaucoup. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. sir. Louisiana Legends is made possible by Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Louisiana. This important program series enables us to discover, through the accomplishments of our fellow Louisianians, the unique character of the state so proudly served by Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Louisiana for 60 years.